Dean Khan, thank you very thank much you. for coming thank in. You. Uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. I'm excited about it. We've been talking about this and music for, <laughs> for a long time. For a long time, time since we yeah. first met. Yeah, that's I think right. it was when we first met, we were talking, and you said that you were a blues fan. Mm-hmm. And I said, have you ever heard of John Joe Bonamassa? And you said, no. I said, you got to hear. And, and I interrupted what we were talking about. It was our first meeting, and I brought on Joe and, and Beth Hart. Yeah. And uh, I just said, you got to listen to, to them together. And it, it brings tears to your eyes, right? I, I don't know if I remember anything that we've ever talked about besides that. Yeah. So, I mean, was, <laughs> you know. so for the audience, if you want to hear something that will bring just tears to your eyes, Joe Bonamassa, yeah. Beth Hart together, some of the best blues performance you're going to see. Well, and there's a couple of others that you've introduced me to as well. You, you knew to, Susan Tedeschi, yeah. but we talked about that, but yeah. But uh, Papa yeah. Chubby, Papa Chubby, mm-hmm. yeah, that when was some fantastic. great blues guitar. Listen to Papa Chubby. So, uh, <laughs> you know, before we started, Nick mentioned that we could do a whole podcast just on the music, and we could. Well, if we so. put on Joe and, and and Beth doing "I'd Rather Go Blind," I mean, you'll see it'll bring tears to the audience's eyes. We but, may yeah. we may see if we can pull that up before we're, okay. we're done with All everything. Right. Um, okay, so uh, we've got a few things to talk about today, sure. and uh, and these. These are all uh, continuations from things that we've been talking about over now two and a half years that you've been the dean here. Not quite so, two and a half, but whatever. Who's counting? Yeah. Right? So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit of background for you for the folks listening, and uh, but we're gonna actually pick up each of these as we move through. So. Your, uh, your, all your degrees, uh, including your uh, hematology and medical oncology, are from UPenn. Um, That's mag- right. Magna cum laude, I Summa. believe. Summa cum laude. Uh, got yeah. Got to take credit yeah. for what you got. Yeah. Summa. Yeah. 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 So congratulations there. You've also uh, did a P- uh, PhD and MBA at uh, Tulane while you were there. MBA we're going to talk Tulane. about right. that mm-hmm. uh, part as well. And you are a a fellow of the um, the uh, Royal College of Physicians in London, but there aren't very many uh, American educated physicians from in the fellowship, right? Yeah. So the way it works is if you train in the UK uh, or a, a Commonwealth uh, country, so that includes India, mm-hmm. other countries. Um, you can uh, become a member of the Royal College of Physicians by taking an exam. It's known to be a pretty difficult exam. Uh, then after you're in practice a couple of years with some recommendations, et cetera, and it's not sort of a semi-secretive process, you, become, you can become a fellow of the Royal College. So there's a few people who didn't train in Commonwealth institutions who are fellows of the Royal College. And it was really cool because for the ceremony, I got to go to London, right? And um, it's old. Not uh, the, the society, when I uh, was made a fellow, that was its 501st year. So really, it's under King Hen- it started under King Henry VIII. So in the lounge, if you will, or the library, not the lounge, there's a, a beautiful oil uh, uh, painting of Henry VIII. And you wear these purple gowns, and it's a very British ceremony. And, you know, there's a dinner to follow. And I was at the dinner, and there was... You know, somebody who had been knighted and his wife, what, whatever, were there. And the toast, uh, characteristically, is the queen. And that's that's the, the formal dinner. So I want to really see pictures. Cool. I want to see pictures. I have a picture in my office yeah. of me in the purple gown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love yeah. to see it. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk about this. We're also going to talk about uh, a few other things that you've done. Spend most of the time today talking about your current role as the sure. dean. But uh, before we do, I've got to uh, ask you to tell the story of your experience with the elephant. Yeah, it's an, so I was a, you know, I was a brand new faculty member, right? So as a brand new faculty member, you're going to want to do everything. I mean, one of the things I was bad about is I didn't say no, right? Just say yes to everything. Um, later in my career, I actually helped people say no, something I was never very good at. But um, I got a call um, from the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans. They uh, had a, a, a program where they would take an endangered species and do in vitro fertilization to a related but not endangered species in an effort to prolong the endangered species and not put an endangered species 
at health risk for pregnancy and gestation. So they were working with an animal called a bongo. If you look it up, it's a striped antelope, pretty animal. And the, the bongos were anemic and were dying of um, strokes. So they said, you know, would you look at the blood of a bongo? So what the hell do I know about a bongo? But, you know, I'm a hematologist and I kind of like interspecies stuff. So I went to the zoo and they gave me a slide and I took it back. Or they gave me a tube of blood and I made a, took it back and made a slide and stained it. And I'm looking at it. And one of my colleagues came over and he looked through, you know, two-headed scope. He said, oh, sickle cell. I said, yeah, but this is an antelope in the zoo. So now I'm getting excited because, you know, um, I called the vet at the zoo. I said, this is amazing. I said, you know, sickle cell causes stroke and it causes blood in the urine and it can kill people. And I think you've got some antelopes here. They clearly, they're sickle cells. I think, you know, she said, how does it explain stroke? I explained it to her. So I thought I was on to some great discovery. Can you explain it? How does it explain? How does it explain stroke? So when cells sickle, they clog blood vessels, mm -hmm. essentially, and clog blood vessels cause a stroke. So, um, but I remembered when I was a, a, a medical resident, I remember that there were some pulmonologists who were using sheep, and they figured out that their sheep had an unusual cardiac conduction abnormality, and they traced it because they knew who the sheep's parents were, and they sent in a, a report to a veterinary journal on autosomal dominance called Wolf, Parkinson, White, and sheep. And when they told um, some veterinarians in the vet school at Penn about this, they laughed because all sheep have Wolf, Parkinson, White. So I remembered that story and said, I really don't know what I'm talking about. So I called somebody at Penn, and it turns out these animals, their cells do sickle on a microscope slide, but not Okay, so that's not what was happening. What was happening is they were giving them high doses of estrogens. Wait, so so I'm getting the, the elephants. They weren't. No, no, okay. I know you're going there, but the cells weren't sickled in, in the, the body. It yeah. just on the slide. Okay, right. But still, it's pretty cool. And he said, yeah. I don't know if bongo cells sickle or not, but I did know that white-tailed deer sickle and some other animals. So it all made sense. So anyway. Then they said, but we're also having an issue with elephants. I said, what's your issue with elephants? I said, well, elephants, you may not know this, get human TB. And when elephants get tuberculosis, you have a huge problem, no pun intended, because yeah. elephants are kind of ruminants and you don't know which stomach cavity the drugs would go to and the amount of, of antibiotics you'd need is huge. And when elephants get human TB, it becomes a public health issue, right? So they thought that a certain cell in uh, elephant blood might be related, it was a monocyte that looked different than ours, might be related to uh, TB. So they said, uh, will you look at some slides and just manually count? And I won't tell you which slide is from an elephant with TB, but let's see if there's a difference. But first, we want to get blood from the two elephants in our zoo. I said, sure. You know, will you draw the blood? It's like, how can I say no to that? So I went up and I drew blood from the elephant. And I didn't know if I could outrun an elephant, but I knew I could get a head start because they're laying down. So I stood between the elephant and the door, right? And the elephants were, were cows, so they're pretty docile and they knew their trainers. Turns out no relationship. But then the vet called me and she said, you know, I was asked to write a book a chapter in Shalm's textbook of veterinary hematology. I have it in my office. It's about that thick on elephants. Will you write it with me? I said, of course I will. I'm a new faculty member, right? This is great. And she called me back. She said, you know, I can't pay you. I said, oh, no, no, no. I don't need to be paid. I just need to be a co-author in the chapter. So, yes, yeah, so I wrote a chapter on hematology of the elephant. So, so long answer to your question. but I appreciate the long answer. I have more questions about the elephant. How big was the needle? So it was a standard human needle but you draw blood from an elephant in the ear and you have the elephant lay down mm -hmm. and the, the veins in the ears are about as big as your thumb. I mean, you yeah. can't miss. And the elephants have pretty thick skin. It doesn't bother them a lot. Um, you know, they, they, they don't even always flinch when you take blood from them. So, so you mentioned about this chapter. It's, one of the things that's always been interesting to me about you is that you have 100 plus research articles. You are you're still, even as dean, you're still very active in scholarship. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit more as we start talking about the future of medicine, because I think that's going to be an important component of it as well. So at Tulane, you were a student affairs dean. Yes. 20, 20 years. Year, years. Um, and so I'm going to ask you a question that relates to that plus your current role. And it has to do with the future of medicine. So you've seen 
both at Tulane and, and at UNLV, how the uh, students are, are uh, taught and so forth. And you have some ideas about the future of medicine and, and then how we prepare for that. So let's talk about that first, and then we can talk about things that maybe need to shift. You know, it's really um, uh, interesting, Mark. So when I went to medical school and became, you know, did my and, and trained in internal medicine and hematology oncology, we were trained to be diagnosticians. So what I really liked about internal medicine was getting a constellation of symptoms and findings and putting it together and saying, this is what's going on in this mm -hmm. patient. But, you know, computers can do that better than us. Um, you know, um, IBM Watson was used a little bit as a diagnostic tool. Didn't quite catch on, but some of the other big companies are trying other uh, computers using artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. machine learning to make diagnoses. So that moving forward is not going to be as important. So we need to think about what, what are physicians going to be in the future? You know, one of the things that machines aren't going to be able to do well is coach. And a very important, because it needs that human element. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I may be proven wrong, but I think that's one of the unique features. And, you know, we need to do a better job teaching our medical students how to coach patients to modify behavior, whether that's taking their medicine or losing weight or stopping smoking. That's critical. The other thing that's different is when I went to medical school, you know, the physician, we didn't talk about teams. If we talked about teams, we talked about teams run by physicians. And clearly, clearly we know now that medicine is best practiced in teams of professionals. Some teams, the physician's going to be in charge. The operating room, you know, the surgeon's going to be in charge. But other teams, physicians shouldn't be in charge, um, although they can be valuable team members. And we're starting to learn that. So we need to teach our students in those models. So inner professional education becomes really, really important. The other thing that happens is um, when I was in medical school, there were three people in my class who didn't go to class, and they were notorious. Um, one of them was a PhD uh, and a very successful PhD. He didn't go to class because he was in the lab. Uh, he now holds a very high position at a major university, and he is a laboratory scientist, right? So everything for him. Another guy um, just didn't go to class. He was kind of a strange guy. But the third guy didn't go to class because he was writing poetry. So he's a physician who's been a published and very accomplished poet. My point being that we went to class. Students don't go to class anymore. Yeah. And the reason they don't go to class is with everything recorded, there's no reason to then sit and listen to someone. In fact, here, we've changed the whole curriculum. There's almost no lecture. If I'm going to give a lecture to students, I'm going to record it like we're doing here, and they can listen to it on their own. We're using class for problem solving, things that require teams, things that require discussion. The education literature calls that a flipped classroom, but that's really the way medical education is, and that's going to move forward quickly. I think as we look to the future, though, the U.S., North America, and the Philippines have a model of medical education that's four years of college and four years of medical school. Now, I love having poets come to medical school, but it's a financial luxury to be able to go to college for poetry and then come to medical school. And, you know, with the availability of online materials, it might make sense to say, look, here's an admissions test to medical school, a true admissions test, like the step one exam. If you can pass that, we're going to accept you into medical school. I, we don't care how you got the information. It might have been four years of college. It might have been community college. It might have been online. But if you have that knowledge base and skill set, then come to medical school. Let's make this much more efficient, less expensive. Medical school could probably be done at that point in three years. Let's teach things like working in teams. Let's teach things like coaching. Right? We're also going to provide some science because you have to have some scientific background. But we just need to change because what we're doing now is expensive and inefficient. So, so. you know, we've talked about I had several questions for you, but this topic is so important and so interesting to me. I want to uh, stay on it for a while. I happen to agree with you that I think that, you know, to, in, in a lot of ways, medicine is broken, right? And, and part of it is how we're teaching medicine. Students have figured out a different way to do it rather than the traditional sit in class. 
my first thought about that was, well, we need to incentivize students to be in class, and the way that we do that is to offer them something that they can't get from watching a video. Absolutely, and I don't think medicine's necessarily broken. I think medical education in the United States is good, but we can't make good the enemy of great, right? It is good. Right. It is good, but I think we can make it great if we think forward and think about how adults learn. So I agree with you, and I and here's what I mean by broken. It goes with your uh, good being the enemy of great. To, you know, I've told you this before. If we want elite level performers, we need to train them like elite level performers, right? right? And so, in the the importance of what our physicians are doing is so great that we can't let it be good, right? right? And and especially in in our state where you know, we're not even at that level. So, I mean, look, Mark, Mark's a, a golfer and a great golf coach. I'm, you know, I played golf a little bit in high school, but if you were going to teach me how to play golf, that would be a lot different than the way you're going to coach, yeah. you know, an elite golfer for UNLV's team, right? right? It's just different. And the thing, I, th- I think that the thing about it, the people that we get into med school, and I think this is probably true across med schools, most of those people are at an elite level as they finish their undergraduate mm-hmm. and they're they're elite level learners but the the part that you're talking about where also be elite level and how you work with teams and how you coach other individuals and how you communicate that's a really important point that I think is missed a lot of times I don't see that in most medical school curriculums I think you're right I think you know we have an advantage in that we are new so we can do things a little different. And in the beginning, we said we're going to do things a little different. And I think, you know, our curriculum, you know, bespeaks a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's limited class, there's limited classroom lecture. That just doesn't make sense with the technology we have now. Right. Let's use the classroom for when we engage the learner. Let's focus on the learner firstly, but let's use a classroom to engage the learner. Yeah. I mean, it's a great point. If if we're going to have team-based medicine, then we teach people how to be good team members, and we can do that in the classroom as, as one of the things we do. But So one of the questions I was going to ask you was this idea, and if you could actually kind of take our listeners through the what used to be hierarchical uh, organization of medicine and now what uh, it is in a lot of places and what you're talking about is this team-based approach. Can you kind of take us through that historically? Yeah. Um, so... Again, um, when I trained, you know, there was a concept that um, a patient would come to a doctor's office with a constellation of symptoms and findings. The doctor would put these together, touch the patient, listen to the patient, talk to the patient, come up with a diagnosis, make a prescription for treatment, uh, and then follow up with the patient. I mean, that was the model, right? A patient would come in with abdominal pain and and go to a surgeon, and the surgeon would diagnose gallstones and schedule the surgery, and the surgeon would do the surgery and then follow up with the patient. But, you know, the model has to change. So using oncology as a model, in an ideal setting, um, a young woman uh, discovers a breast mass and goes to a clinic like the type we want to build at UNLV. That's what we're working on funding on and and have some consultants to help us with right now. But you come to the clinic and what happens is a group of people actually sit down and talk to you. So you will sit down with a surgical oncologist. You may need surgery for a potential breast cancer, radiation oncologist, and a medical oncologist. In addition, there will be people to address mental health needs, people to address some of the financial concerns you have, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's that team of people, some being physicians, some healthcare providers who are not physicians, really coming up with a plan and working towards the best care of the whole patient. That's what I'm talking about. And, and um, you know, and, and understandably that, you know, as, as we have progressed as a society and as medicines, medical sciences progress and so forth, and, and we're now looking at the whole human, we can understand where that goes. How does that, how do we in medical education teach our uh, physicians and, and the people, the rest of the people who will be on the team 
to work together in that way, just like you described. So I think some of that, Mark, is just role modeling, right? So if you have that setup, you put the trainees in that setup. So that's what they're used to seeing. So some of it's that. Some of it's early on really forcing the concept of interprofessional education. So, you know, we do a lot of simulation now mm -hmm. in, in medicine, but the simulation shouldn't be just with medical students. It should involve nursing students, perhaps public health students, pharmacy students. It should involve that team. So you're used to working together. In the team, different people have different roles, but again, you're working together towards that goal of improving health of the patient. So I think it's role modeling, and I think it's early exposure. Okay, so you're, you are the vice president, in addition to your dean role, you're vice president for the academic health center that's being developed here at UNLV, and it includes those groups that Correct. you're talking to. So what's the idea uh, that you have about bringing those groups together in that interdisciplinary work? I, I think it's critical. So yeah. we've come up, um, uh, th this planning committee for academic health that are the um, health science dean, so the dean of um, nursing, medicine, of course, um, uh, integrative health sciences, public health, and dental medicine, include, and, and in addition to some representatives from behavioral and mental health, have been working together to form strategic plans. But also, we've come up with sort of four key goals for the immediate future. One of them is interdiscipline, interprofessional education, absolutely critical. And we have facilities where we can do it. The Sim Center is obvious, um, but we also have to model it in, in real clinical training. And, and that's really the idea. It's interesting. You know, this gets back to your, uh, the example that you gave. If, I, if I'm working with you as a golfer versus I'm working with, you know, somebody at a different level as a golfer, I'm, we're going to work differently, right? And and it seems like a lot of folks will come into the the uh, healthcare space, right? Any of those areas that you just talked about, but they haven't necessarily had any background in how to work together on teams, right. how to receive feedback, how to give feedback. How to, you know, one of the things that you and I both share as what we believe is very important. One of the things that would make sense to me that would be really helpful is to get groups of those students, trainees together, and talk about those things at a foundational level. So then when you put them in groups together, now they can, uh, th they can perform better, right, and that's, learn. That's exactly right. Yeah. And again, you start early so it becomes what folks are accustomed to. Yeah. I have to say, where I trained uh, at Penn, we were a bit ahead of the curve. So when we made rounds, uh, clinical rounds, whether I was a medical student, resident, fellow, didn't matter. We always had pharmacy, phar pharmacy students getting their PharmD degree, nurses, nursing students, etc., nutritionists on the team, and we would go to patients' rooms together. And when we, you know, were done talking to the patients, we would talk as a team. What are the issues, right? So the mm -hmm. pharma. Uh, the, pharma cop, uh, the pharmacy student would say, okay, let me measure some drug levels so we see if we have the right uh, dose of antibiotic. And, you know, the, the dietary student would say, you know, I, I now realize why I need to change the diet from X to Y. And the nurse would understand the plan and say, you know, I talked to the patient's husband and I, I learned this, this, and this, which is critical. I mean, that's the way things have to happen. Oh, I, Medicine I, can't be yeah. practiced in isolation. That sounds like a fantastic model. I mean, I, I'd see that as a model that I'm, I'm guessing from what you're saying that we would like to have here Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so there's a book uh, that I read recently called The Future is Faster Than You Think. And uh -huh. it's, a, it's a phenomenal read, by the way. And, um, and one of the things it talks about is the future of medicine and specifically back to the point that you made about AI involved in medicine from the diagnostic perspective, surgical perspective, so forth and so on. And so you've got this, this path where people are going more towards the technology side of it. And, and based on today's conversation, all of a sudden now it's starting to make me realize how much more important the humanistic side of it is because you do have so much technology that's going to be involved, right? Yeah, I think, you know, technology can do a lot of things and will do more, but that human side still is what I think is going to shape people's behavior. 
And that's going to be critical. There's something about touching a patient that I don't believe a machine's going to be able mm -hmm. to do. You know, uh, some colleagues and I, when I was still at Tulane, wrote a paper that we titled, um, Who's Flying the Plane? And um, the concept is uh, we're talking about telehealth, telemedicine, but in a larger sense. So we use robots in surgery because they can make fine, they, they don't tremp, there's no tremor, firstly. And secondly, they can make very fine cuts. But they're always directed by a surgeon. But there's probably no reason why the surgeon needs to be in the same room, right, mm -hmm. with enough bad bandwidth that's going to occur across the country, across the world, actually. But even more so, the Defense Department and others are looking to totally automate this because we're limited by our biomechanics. So it may be that a machine can do an appendectomy making movements that the human body can't that mm -hmm. are more efficient mm -hmm. and somehow safer. The title of our article really reflects the fact that, you know, when you look at how much time pilots spend flying a plane, I think I'm right, I think I remember from the article, it's three or six minutes. Total. It, depending on whether they're doing manual landing or not. Yeah. I may get this wrong. If there are pilots listening, I apologize. But it's not much time, right? And it ought to be that way. People have been asked, would you feel comfortable flying in a plane that's totally automatic? And it's gaining acceptance. I mean, look, people are gaining acceptance of driverless cars, right? right? That's where we're going, right? So if machines are going to be able to do some of the surgical procedures with or without us, what are physicians doing? And again, it's that human component. It's the compassion. It's modifying behavior. It's that part that I think is going to remain essential. But it's a skill set we have to teach. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the interesting thing to me is the concern but also the opportunity is – if we start looking, and for us, because we're relatively new med school and, we, you know, things aren't carved in stone at this point, if we start looking at that future and seeing these are the skill sets that need to be trained for future physicians instead of looking backwards, it gives us a real opportunity to, to be at the forefront. I think you're right. And we also have the advantage of having a relatively small class so you can do these things, right? Right. And we're getting a new, brand new med ed building that was designed with some of these mm -hmm. concepts in mind. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, we've got, we have lots of things in front of us that we can, yeah. uh, great opportunities. Absolutely. So, so let's step away from the education side and talk about you've got an organization, organizations that you run through the medical school, right, and, and eventually with the academic health s center. And one of the conversations we had uh, just recently was talking about looking for people who match the right profile for the right position. Right. And by profile, what I mean is, uh, you know, basically square pegs, square holes, so if we look at a, a spectrum of from at one end, somebody who's very strategy centric and at another end, somebody who's very operations centric um, and everything in between, what's your strategy of hiring people, for you know, right people for the right positions based on that continuum? Yeah, I think that, you know, I've worked with a few truly visionary people uh, and um, they're really fun to work with. What you lose with a truly visionary person is that operations component. Mm -hmm. So I worked with a dean who was truly visionary. Uh, and he remains a friend and colleague. Um, and he'd say, well, you know, I think we ought to start a satellite campus, you know, 70 miles from here. Fine. And by the way, I want it done by the end of the summer, right? So you need that operations piece. I tend to, I think, I've been told, behave more like him. And when I took this job, people said, you need operations people around you. And I've, I've done that. I have some really, really good operations people. So you can't have one without the other, right? But there's different ways that people, people think. If you're too bogged down in operations, you can never be visionary because you're thinking about all the reasons why you can't do something, right? So, you know, when I, when I hear that, I, so I think you need that mixture, and it depends what job you're looking mm -hmm. for. I mean, I don't like answer to a question, no, because. I like the answer, yes, if. And what I mean by that is if we want to get somewhere, don't say we can't do that because blah, 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 but look at it, flip it. 
say we can do that if we have the following things. That's a much more open mindset. It allows you to solve problems much, much more creatively. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You do, by the way, there are several people that are on the team who are very, very good at operations. Absolutely. I think. Um, it, it's interesting to think about because when we are not specifically us as a med school, but when uh, people are looking for uh, employees, team members, I don't know that they necessarily think about it from that continuum that we're talking about. And a lot of times we get uh, sort of blinded by the shiny thing. You know, where did they go to school and what experience right. did they have as opposed to is this the right fit? That person may be a great fit for this other position, but not for the one that, Correct. that we're doing. It's one of, the, one of the reasons why we like to define the positions and, and the characteristics of that position before we start looking at the, the applications. And look, that extends further. So, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, in my previous job um, counseling medical students and counseling uh, uh, trainees who were mm -hmm. going for their first job. And I always said, look, don't sweat the job you didn't get. Don't sweat the match you didn't get. Somebody figured out you weren't a fit, and thank God you found that out before you ended up in that position. you got to think about it that way. It doesn't mean that the person that got the job is better than you. It means they were a better fit. We're put together differently, right? And what institutions need change over time as well, right? So I always think of this as a business cycle, mm -hmm. and I like startup crisis. I don't like the business cycle where you're maintaining, right? So, you know, if we get to the point where we're maintaining, I'm probably not the right person for your job. Crisis, startup, that's what I really like, right? We're, and some leaders are best when you're trying to decline and shut down, right? Yeah. You have to have the right person in the right place. Well, good news for you. We, we're not at a maintenance <laughs> yeah, stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, and, and I think, uh, you know, just thinking about it from that perspective gives a different level of sophistication. There's a country song that you've probably heard, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Mm -hmm. um, I think about how those things are opportunities, and, and we don't know necessarily how that door being shut is going to help us or not. And, and if we just have, you know, a, a faith in it, a belief in it, and, and that kind of mentorship where you're saying, look, this, this is probably in your best interest. Right. It takes a lot of the pressure off. So, so, Mark, you know, look, the first job that I looked at as I was finishing my fellowship that I really wanted was a job at the University of Michigan. My wife and I even bought Michigan sweatshirts. Um, and, you know, it was to be a bone marrow transplant. Doc. Yeah. I mean, that's completely what I don't do, right? So I think others figured out that that wasn't the right fit yeah. for me, and that was good. Yeah. And I think you just have to look at things that way. This is, you know, back to the skills that we need to be teaching to our trainees, to our students. This is a really important skill to be able to look at things from that perspective instead of taking it personally, right? But also to be able to look at it and say, this is a good opportunity for me yeah. or this is not. Right. Right? That's right. You know, they're looking for something that I'm not going to be good at. That's not the right fit for me, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that these that that it really starts to shift some of the skills that uh, uh, and and abilities that we want to have our folks know to help them to be you know happier, healthier, more productive, and also to help them put teams together mm -hmm. that make sense. You mm -hmm. can't have a team of visionaries. Right. You're going to have great discussions. <laughs> You're just not going to get anything done. Nothing. And yeah. you can't have a yeah. team of operations folks either because. You're not going to get anything done. Right. They won't know where to go. Right. So, so something in between. To, yeah. You need to have that mixture. Mm -hmm. yeah, and agree. that's why teams are important. That's why we can't do this alone. That's why we can't do healthcare alone. It's a, yeah, I mean, it goes all the way back to the team-based approach. So this actually makes me think about, you know, again, one of your degrees is an MBA at from Tulane. And how have you used that? Like some of these seem to me like this is more your philosophy than something that you learned in the classroom. Yeah. So um, I went and got my MBA. I'm not sure I knew what a stock and a bond were at the time, but there were, and I was 20 years older than everyone else in the class and it was a great experience. But, 
you know, a couple things I think that you learn. The, the trivial stuff that you become an expert in Excel, which can really run the planet, but you know, that's not what's important. What is important is, as physicians, we're not thought to think strategically, because you can't. If the patient's crashing, you have to do many things at once to try to save the patient. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what worked as long as that collection of things worked. So we don't, we're not taught to think strategically, but in healthcare, it's critical. Mm -hmm. So strategic thinking is something that I grew an appreciation for when I was in business school. The second thing was most business schools require sort of a capstone course, something like new venture planning, where you come up with a business idea and a business plan, and you present that, and it's required. And I said, yeah, it's fine, but I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not going to start my own company. And in my own naivete, I didn't realize that every new program that I started was actually entrepreneurial. Now, I wasn't getting you know, revenue from it, but if I could use a business plan, it would be much better to make that happen. So I realized that every new venture, every innovation that we do should have a business plan. And if I hadn't gone to business school, I, I quite frankly wouldn't have thought about that. So I want to take this idea into something that I think is, was a really important part of your career, and that is how you managed when the hurricane came to New Orleans. So... Um, you know, August 29th, 2005 is a day that few New Orleanians will, will forget. So living on the Gulf Coast, you know, we would have hurricanes come through. And I always had a fair amount of anxiety about them. I probably still do. But what we would do is if we decided we were going to evacuate, we would go to my office because the med school building had been there for a long time. And, you know, I wasn't so much worried. There was a community spirit. We had a dog. We'd bring the dog. We'd bring the kids. About um, six months before Katrina, the medical school had made a decision that they weren't letting us bring pets if we had to evacuate, and they really didn't want people evacuating to the medical school. So, you know, it was a Friday afternoon, and I was at a guitar lesson, and I'd heard that there was a storm in Florida, and I remember my guitar teacher said, I'm kind of worried about this storm. I said, it's in Florida. He goes, oh, no, it made a turn supposed to be bad, and it's coming out this Friday night. So I have some anxiety about it. So Saturday morning, it looked even worse, and I boarded up my house, and we made a plan. And we would normally go to the med school, but we decided, you know what, I'm not on service, and they don't want animals, and we had a dog, so let's all go. We had to find a place to go. So Baton Rouge was full, and Lake Charles was full, so we ended up in Houston. We hadn't really spent much time in Houston. so. We're in Houston, and the storm hits, and the mayor says we dodged a bullet, and then the levees broke. And when I saw that, it was a, that was Monday morning. I came in from a run. My wife was teary-eyed. I said, what, was her house destroyed? And she said, I don't know her house, but look at the city. I said, okay, we got to get the kids into school here. I had young kids. And then I called a colleague I knew at Baylor because I was in Houston. I said, what did you guys do with Hurricane Allison, and how many of our students can you take? And that snowballed into a plan where we moved our entire school from New Orleans to Houston, Texas. That's 350 miles. Um, we were ready to start classes in two and a half weeks when um, Hurricane Rita came through. That's another story. Um, and we had no email until about November. So our students were smart and had Yahoo groups, and we learned about that. And we learned that even though none of the cell phone towers were up, you could still text message. So even communication was tough. But, you know, people would come in and they'd say, because it was getting the right people on the bus, just getting good people to Houston. And we'd plan. And there was a medical student leader. He's in the military now. He's a naval officer. But, you know, Justin, um, I made him dean of housing. Because we had all these students that we were bringing in, and because um, we decided to move the whole school, and we had to find housing. How many housing. people total? Uh, so there are about 200 students. You know, it's about 800 students, yeah. right? So we had to um, oh. find housing, and the Houston community was generous. And people said, "Look, I have a spare room above my garage, and I have a house in the back." And you know, so 
but somebody had to coordinate that. So there was, this, again, right people. He's in the military. He's a leader. Right. Justin, you're in charge. And people would say, I'd rather live in a uh, house where the people are members of the LDS church because that's me. Or I need to be in a house that's LGBTQ friendly. Or I need to be in a house that's going to let me take my cat. Right? It was all those things. So we put it together. But what we did is in two and a half weeks, we had found a copy of our curriculum because everything in New Orleans was destroyed. My office was under about four and a half feet of water. I got nothing out of it um, when um, I got back. Um, and we, you know, figured out a curriculum. We figured out housing. We figured out financial aid. And we were ready to start classes in two and a half weeks. And then Hurricane Rita came through Houston. We had to delay a week. That's a whole other story. But, you know, we did that. And then we, you know, ended up spending the entire academic year in Houston. We taught our students uh, at Baylor College of Medicine's facility. It's huge. They would dissect cadavers in the morning. We did in the afternoon. And for our clinical students, we set up a network of Texas schools that included Texas A&M, Baylor, University of Texas, Houston, and UT Galveston. And we rotated our students. And during that time, we also recruited a class. So we did our recruitment for Tulane in Houston. We graduated, matched and graduated a class. And we only lost two students. And those were, I'm sorry, it was six students we lost. And those were overwhelming stories, loss of personal property and jobs. But we kept our students and we kept our faculty. Um, so remarkable story. People would come and they'd say, what you're trying to do is great, but it's never going to work. The LCME heard what we were doing, and they said, um, you know, we're the LCME. That's the accreditation body, and we need to be involved with what you're doing because originally we were just going to have our students do clinical rotation. They said, no, you can't do that. You have to be in control of that. They were helpful, but we had all these hurdles and all these external forces, but it worked. So when I got back to New Orleans, I said, you know, there's something to organization. There's something to management. This worked, but maybe it would have been better if I had an MBA, and that's when I decided to get an MBA. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah it's it's still I mean, like we've talked about this a couple times. It's still remarkable to me. Like that is such a huge endeavor to be able to do. Period. Much less under duress. Much less under that kind of a time constraint to be able to do it. And you know those people like the uh, Justin, I believe you said. Mm -hmm. um, Wow, what a what a remarkable job and memory that he's going to have forever mm -hmm. as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, it's incredible. And you know, we started out with myself, the academic affairs dean, and the dean sitting around a table not bigger than this in a room smaller than this, saying, "Okay, this is what we have to do." And then we got people on board, and we gave people tasks, and. Every day we'd have a, a debrief at four o'clock. Okay, I didn't get this done, but I did get this done, and this new problem came up, and uh, this is a barrier to do that. You know, that's what we did. It was a war room. Yeah, I mean that's exactly what it sounds and like. And we got it done. Part of it, Mark, was the president of the university had made a decision to close the university for a semester. I thought if Tulane closed for a semester, we would lose all of our good faculty. Um, students would transfer, and I'm not sure we would have survived. And there had to be a different way to do this, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what we did. And you know, you were running on this adrenaline. I, I, I didn't want to think about what happened to my house, maybe, or you know, I wanted to make sure people I knew were safe, but I didn't know that. So this was a way of also displacing energy. Let's just focus on this and get this done. I went to uh, New Orleans afterwards to work in the Ninth Ward for a little bit, yeah. and it was remarkable how the devastation just in that area. Unbelievable. So, yeah. For years, Mark, there were watermarks on buildings. Yeah. I mean, for just years and years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, remarkable. But you realize what's important Yeah. also, right? So your house isn't important. It, it's just not. Your office isn't important. All that stuff that I lost, I don't think about most of it now. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's great to hear. That's a, and it's a remarkable. And you wrote a paper on this, right? Many. Yeah. So my CV, there's yeah. many papers. Yeah. So we, yeah, we were very productive with getting this story out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's an incredible story all yeah. the way through. So um, I'm going to ask you some advice uh, on behalf of other people. So I'm a uh, 
I'm a college student. I want to go to med school. Uh, what's your advice for me? The first advice I'd give you is it's a great career. You can do lots of things in medicine. It's a career that gives you the true privilege of really working with people, sometimes during the toughest points of their lives. And that's a privilege. And you're, you have an opportunity to make their lives or deaths better, right? I think that um, advice I'd give is follow your passion. I, I think the advice I'd give is um, you're going to work hard, but it's worth it. I'm going to tell you not to worry about the debt of medical school because, you know, you're going to do just fine financially. And again, I think, although I don't do as much clinical medicine as I used to, I think that, again, that bespeaks the many things you can do in the medical field. Okay, now you're looking for the next level, so you're going to, you want to go into a specialty, right? What is it that helps people in, in this decision about where they pick? So, you know, I think specialty choice is personality and it's role models. So when I went to college, I didn't have a lot of money. I had financial aid, and part of my financial aid was work study. I had friends that worked in the um, cafeteria in the dorm or the mailroom. I got a job in a lab in the medical school. Right? And it started just washing dishes fundamentally, but then I got a project and I was able to publish my first paper and you know, present stuff, and I think that's why I'm in academic medicine today. Um, but that was in a gastroenterology lab. So I was sort of saying, I think this is what I want to do. I want to be a liver doc, a hepatologist. My last rotation as a medical student was in hematology, and the hematologists at Penn were just a great group. And what I liked is they were great internists, which I wanted to be, but they also had this subspecialty ilk that made them know things that other people didn't know, and it was role modeling. And then I also derived some career satisfaction with end-of-life care and making deaths easier, right? So everything kind of came together. So I think for, for trainees, it's going to be role modeling. It's going to be who do I want to be and who don't I want to be? A couple things you need to figure out. I spoke, I've spoken over the years with many medical students who, who are in their third year and say, I just don't know what I want to do. And in a couple months, I have to start applying for residency. And there's a couple fundamental things. Do you have to be in the, in the operating room? That's a yes or no, right? If it's a maybe, then that gives you some flexibility, but that's important. Two, are you somebody that works to live, meaning that you work to get the financial resources to do the things that you need to do, or do you live to work? Meaning that you um, see yourself through your job because different specialties are more adaptive to different personality types. So, for example, um, when I was early in my career as a student affairs dean, there was a medical student who was hell-bent on being first in his class. He wasn't, by the way, a woman beat him. but. But that's what he wanted. And he was going to be a transplant surgeon. Makes sense, right? The 11th hour, he decides, and I'm not condemning a field, but the 11th hour, he said, no, I think I want to be a dermatologist. And I said, I just don't see it, right? You know, it sounds like you live to work. And, you know, dermatology gives you lots of time to do things outside of work, but I just don't see it. And he didn't listen. He matched in dermatology and then switched to general surgery, right? So it's that... I had a colleague in, in, in medical school who was a great artist. He was a painter. He was a sculptor. And he went into emergency medicine because it gave him, you know, time to do those other things. So I think the advice is know yourself, choose a specialty for what it is, not what you think you can make it, and look at role models. Who's your role model? Who do you want to be? And that, that's really what happens. So do you think that, that physicians in general, and, and then specifically our physicians, um, understand how important the, the role model piece is? I hope so. I mean, in academic medicine, I hope so. That's part of our job, right? I remember talking to students who would get comments in their dean's letter, you know, their final evaluation, and it would say something like, I hope that they decide to go into pediatrics. And the student said, well, I don't want to go into pediatrics. I don't want that in my dean's letter. I said, no, 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 no. The fact that people want you to be like mm -hmm. them is a great compliment, mm -hmm. right? So that needs to be there. Even though you're not applying in peds, it meant they thought so much of you that they want to train you in their image, so to speak, right? Yeah. 
So that's a compliment. So I, th I would hope in academics people realize that's what their job is, right? It's to make people passionate about what you feel your passion so much that they want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's one of the things where you could continue this uh, idea, right, because even junior faculty have role models who are senior faculty and so forth along the way. It's, it's just incredibly important. Right. So our medical school, what's next? I think a couple things are next. I think um, because there is such a shortage of physicians in this state, we'd like to slowly increase our class size. Now, we never want to be bigger than, um, we never want to be so big that we don't have enough clinical material to teach our trainees, right? But I think we can probably pretty safely go from 60 to 90 students with our new med ed building. Uh, assuming we can hire some more faculty and have the resources to do that. So I think that's one thing. I think the new med ed building is going to be state of the art. I think we need to think about, um, you know, how we use simulation, virtual reality. That's going to be critical moving forward. Yeah. I think, inter, as we talked about, interprofessional uh, education is key. I think the medical school clearly has to grow its research budget, especially its externally funded research. And that research has to directly relate to community problems. We don't have the luxury to study a gene that may or may not be important, but we have to study things like healthcare disparities, mm -hmm. access to care, obesity, aging, cancer. And that's where we need to focus. So I think edu rounding out research is going to be critical. I think we have to continue to be engaged in our community. It's one of our pillars is community engagement. We are working on some mobile clinics. We're working on some community-based clinics. And as much as possible, we need to bring health care to people rather than people to health care. And then I think we need to be seen as the place that you go to for high quality, acceptable cost quality care. And we need to develop and build out our subspecialists and primary care base so that we can do that. And we need to do that together as an academic health system. Yeah, those are some big ones, but, but we need it. We need we it. We need it. So I've got one more question for you. There's something that, um, I have no evidence for this, but I believe that there's something really important, a story that you have that we haven't talked about before. Okay. But Can't I wait to hear what you're saying. I would like you to tell me what that is. Something that you feel is important, something that, that we haven't talked about, but you think is an important message. So when I was growing up, um, I grew up in a suburb of Philadelphia. Um, my high school was, class was about 450 students. Less than 40 went to college. My high school didn't give the SATs. But one of the things that I did is when I was 12, I got, had a paper route. And when I was 14, I lied about my age and worked in a restaurant. And I later managed that restaurant when I was in high school because they thought I was older than I actually was. And as I think about it, that was an incredibly valuable experience because that was my really first opportunity to manage people and to work with people and to learn that there's all different types of people, but you need, again, that team to make mm -hmm. things work, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's a story, and I think the message is take advantage of opportunities, right, and use those opportunities to learn and grow. Take advantage of the opportunities, learn to work with teams, learn to manage teams. I mean, it's a theme that's uh, come around. It's so interesting to me how those those experiences that we have at early on in life can then be a common thread throughout the rest of the life. I call it a serendipity lens, Yeah. right? You say, you know, so I had work study and I ended up in a lab and, yeah. you know, right? I mean, just those things that happen through serendipity. My first job at Tulane, when I was a chief resident at Penn, I had a, a clumsy medical student on my team, but I liked him. And, you know, I worked with him, so he became less clumsy. And, and um, you know, at the end of the rotation, I was giving him feedback, and I said, you know, where are you from, Mitch? I'm kind of from all over. What does your dad do? Oh, my dad just became the chairman of medicine at Tulane. 
fast forward, Mitch talks to his dad, his dad, you know, several years later, his dad's looking for a residency director and calls me. Oh, that's it's fantastic. just that serendipity. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's right. So. That's right. Fortune shines on the prepared, right? That's right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dean Mark Kahn. This was thank an you. absolute Appreciate pleasure. It. Thank pleasure. You.